Our text this morning, you'll find it's in the Old Testament, uh, the book of Kings, 2 Kings, that is. And it, uh, 2 Kings uh, chapter 10, uh, verses 28 through 31. <clears throat> It says, thus Jehu wiped out Baal from Israel, but Jehu did not turn aside from the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nepat, which he caused Israel to commit, the golden calves that were in Bethel and in Dan. And the Lord said to Jehu, because you have done well in carrying out what I consider right, and in accordance with all that was in my heart, have dealt with the house of Ahab, your sons to the fourth generation shall sit on the throne of Israel. But Jehu was not careful to follow the, follow the law of the Lord, the God of Israel, with all his heart. He did not turn from the sins of Jeroboam, which he caused Israel to commit. Uh, let's pray. <clears throat> well, God, what we want to do at this time is we uh, want to continue in an act of worship. Uh, but instead of song, we want the text to be our God and what... What we mean by that is that we need your spirit to guide us, uh, to take a portion of scripture and uh, over the next few minutes uh, allow that to echo around this place and to find a resting place inside of our hearts, inside of our minds, in, in such a way that um, transformation takes place, even if it is to the smallest of degree. Uh, we pray for that of oh God. So we offer this time and we offer our lives to you in hopes that through communing with you in this moment, uh, we, um, we become more like you, more like your son, Jesus. And we ask this in the name of Christ. Amen. Now, last week we started something, uh, a, a new series uh, where we looked at, we're going to look at some kings in, in the Old Testament. And the idea is to learn some lessons from them. Uh, last week we talked about how um, we, we have a united kingdom under King David and under um, Solomon, but after Solomon's death, there, there's uh, sort of a, a division that takes place where you have a kingdom in the north and a kingdom in the south. And, and the first king in the north was a guy by the name of Jeroboam. And, and Jeroboam uh, turned out to be really a horrible king. And mainly because he made some of his most important decisions out of fear. And, uh, and, and he, he didn't see the, the lasting effects that one decision made today can, can influence, you know, the next 30, 40 years down the road. And so he rids, uh, he, he prohibits the people in the north from traveling south to worship at the temple. Um, he creates these new places, these new centers of worship one in the very northern part of, of Israel called, in a city called Dan, and, and one just above the southern border called Bethel. And he erected these giant golden calves and said, these are going to be, uh, this is what you're going to worship. You're not going to worship at the temple. So, so all, all of the history that we've had and, and relationship that we've had with Yahweh, with God, we're not going to do that anymore. He creates a new national religion, and it ends up uh, sending the people down a path morally that leads to destruction, and it actually affects their decisions that they make, uh, even as, as a political group and, and as, a, as a territory, as a kingdom. And it just sets them down just the wrong path. Well, eventually, Jeroboam dies. Uh, he, he ruled for about 22 years, and uh, there, his, a couple of his sons take the reins, and, we, and, we, and they, they're sort of bit players, they, they last a few years, and then they die, and eventually we get to this king named Ahab, and uh, not Ahab from Moby Dick, this is one a little bit before that, and, uh, but Ahab, you, if you don't know anything about Ahab, you, you, at least you might know something about the people that were connected to him, or at least tied to him in, in some fashion. Uh, one of them was his wife Jezebel, and the other one was the major prophet of that day, was a guy by the name of Elijah. And so the Old Testament is filled with these stories where Ahab and Jezebel square off against Elijah. And, uh, and they have all these different conflicts and, and things that go on uh, while he's ruling. Well, Ahab is, uh, is, does something that so many people do when they're faced with uh, a, a time of influence, when they're given an opportunity to, to either rule as a king or to influence other people. 
they, they want to be great. And so in efforts to want to be great, they, have, they, they think of things that they must do that will distance themselves from the pack from others. And so if Jeroboam has created this national religion, Ahab's one-ups Jeroboam by, by creating another national religion. Now this time, not to these golden, these golden calves, he, he sets up all these worship centers, all these altars and temples to Baal, who just happens to be the major god from his wife's uh, family, they live in a different area. And so instead of having one in the north and one in the south or just, just above the southern border of, of Dan and Bethel for these giant golden calves, they're, they're there, but he creates all these other worship centers uh, to, to the god Baal and uh, changes the national religion. He hires a bunch of priests that work just for him and help aid people uh, in this new religion. And, uh, and he does that for a number of years. And then he eventually dies, and his son Ahazai, uh, his oldest, gets the throne. And, and he's, he's maybe there for a year or two, and then he dies in battle. And so then his next oldest son, a guy by the name of, of um, Joram, or Jehoram, it's spelled both ways in the Old Testament, he now becomes king. And so he continues everything that his dad Ahab did. And, and, and fostering this new national religion, leading the people down these, these, uh, these different paths. And, and so finally, after 12 years, the people have enough. And uh, they, they begin to cry out to Elisha. Now the major prophet in that time is not Elijah, but it's Elisha. And Elisha seeks God and, and gets an answer from God. And, and God tells Elisha, he says, I've had enough of it too. And so what we're going to do is I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you a new king. I want you to go to Jehoram's major general, a guy by the name of Jehu, and I want you to tell him that he is going to be the king. But it comes with conditions. He can be the king, but he's got to walk in my ways, and he's got to rid the house of Israel of Ahab and his legacy. And so Jehu's at a meeting, Elisha walks in with the other generals and, and basically lays this out on the table, and, and Jehu's a smart guy. And so he, he knows that if Elisha is about to anoint him as the next king in front of Jehoram's other generals, well, that could be a death sentence for him. Uh, so he immediately looks at the other generals, and they all see that it's a good thing, and they said they've had enough of it too. And so uh, instantly he puts that plan in action, and he rids uh, of, 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 of Jehoram. He gets rid of Jehoram. He gets rid of all their descendants. And so he begins uh, his reign uh, by doing this reform inside of, whoops, wrong one. Oh. We're going to say, that's the last song, right? So I'm, I'm ahead. Let me keep going. Well, don't worry about the slides. We're all good. See, John is teaching me how to move them on my iPad. I'm just a slow learner. And, uh, but he begins his reign by tearing down the altars of Baal and, and by getting rid of all the priests. And, uh, and there's a couple of chapters in the Bible that describe that whole process. But basically, wherever there was an altar to, to Baal, it becomes a garbage pile. It's completely erased. And, and he sets up uh, this wonderful part of reform uh, for the northern kingdom uh, at, that goes on for uh, a number of years. However... He stops short. He gets rid of uh, Ahab and Ahab's legacy and all the things that were plaguing the people, but he doesn't do anything with the golden calves. Why? That's the question I want us to think about today. I mean, if you, if you see God has moved you into this place of leadership and you're given an opportunity for influence and, you've given, and God gives you a playbook, of things that you do. He, he, he begins and does wonderful with Ahab. Gets rid of all those things, but he doesn't do anything with the first problem. The problem of Jehoram. What causes people to not do that? Or to act like Jehu? Maybe he thought that was enough. You know, for 40 years, the house of Ahab was plaguing the northern kingdom. 
uh, through Ahab and then through his, his sons. And, and so he, he gets rid of this previous generation's faults and mistakes. And, and so maybe he, he sits down on the throne one day and says, that's enough. After all, the real problem was, was Ahab, was Jezebel, and all the things that they did. Or maybe it's something deeper. Maybe it's not just uh, tackling what's the immediate Maybe there's something uh, inside of him, and it seems to be inside of a number of others that sort of works against seeing something all the way through, particularly when it comes to things of faith. The way Jesus tells it is this way. Jesus in uh, Mark chapter 4 ter- tells this parable. We know it as the parable of the sore where he says that there's this farmer that goes out, he casts seed all over the grounds, and some of the seed that he throws lands on good soil, and it does exactly what it's supposed to do. It buries itself down in the soil, and, and over time it, it uh, grows and becomes this major crop. It says some of it just falls on this hard ground, and there's nothing that takes place in, in, in at all. It's as, as if it hasn't been thrown in the first place. But there are two soils that he highlights. He says there's one that it looks good on the surface, but underneath it's full of rocks. And so it grows for a little bit, but it doesn't see it all the way through because it has no depth. It has no, no way to really put out roots. And he said there's another soil that as soon as it starts to go and as soon as it starts to grow and as soon as it starts to mature, all of a sudden there are these weeds that show up and they end up choking out what is good and so it can't continue. And maybe there's something like this going on in Jehu. And maybe there's something like this that goes on even inside of us. You know, do, do you ever wonder, either in your own life or see it in someone else's life, where there's things that exist in our lives that we know prohibit us from growing? Maybe someone's pointed it out to us. Maybe we know that they're there. Uh, and it's just one of those things we're going to get to someday. Maybe, we, uh, maybe that's what we're going to tackle next year. Maybe when, you know, when I get a little bit older or when I, when I slow down a little bit, maybe when my calendar is easier, you know, maybe when I can, can drop hold of this, then, then I'll pick up this stuff over here. Have you ever wondered how that happens? See, over time, we'll, uh, we justify it. We, you know, I'm, I'm busy right now, and, and besides Shane, there's some, you know, there's, there's some other things I'm tackling, and, and I'll get to this later. Uh, so we justify it, or, or even we deny that it's there. Often that happens when someone who's close to us points out that maybe there's a behavior or there's something that's inside of our life that is that is causing things to destroy maybe relationships maybe it, it's detrimental to our health maybe it's detrimental to the way that we think the way that we act and, and maybe a spouse or or a close friend uh, maybe a parent or a child points that out and instantly we deny that it's there that's not me maybe that's you see the problem is over time we eventually get to the point where we don't even see it anymore. You ever wondered how that happens? And maybe that's what happened to Jehu. Maybe Jehu spent so much of his time and energy ridding the place of Ahab and Ahab's legacy and, 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 and when that was done, maybe he got distracted and he just stopped short of everything that was needed or asked of by God. And how often do we do that as well? Yes, Shane, I know I need to do something about this. Or I know I need to do something about that. But that's going to be tomorrow's problem. Or maybe I'll tackle it when it's, uh, when my calendar allows me to. And see, if you do that over time, eventually you don't even see what's blocking us from growing. The goal of the Christian life is to mature in our faith. So are there things that uh, are prohibiting us 
from maturing in our faith. C.S. Lewis wrote a number of books. One of them is uh, probably The po Problem of Pain. You've heard me talk about that book. That's probably my favorite. Maybe the next one to me is The Great Divorce. It's a, uh, it's, it's a story that has to do with these people. They live in this city. It's called Hell. And it's gray, it's, it's, uh, it's all kind of voids, it's, it's drab, uh, the sun never shines, and, and, and people, they don't participate or act around each I mean, it's just a horrible place to be. And they, uh, they get on a bus, they're able to leave hell for a moment, to leave that city, and the bus takes them to another city called heaven. And so when the, when, when, when we, when the story opens, they're queuing up to get on the bus and, and they get to, to this, the, the, the gates of this new city and they, they come off the bus and they have an opportunity to go in. But the people have lived down in this gray place for such a long time that eat, as they approach the gates into this new city, it's so bright and the sun shines all the time. There's so much color that, that it, it overwhelms them. And so the, the book is about the, how the people respond to the opportunity to go into this new city. And there's this one guy, we only know him by the big man. We don't know his name, he's just called the big man. And in chapter four, this big man gets off the bus and he's getting ready to go uh, at least to take a look in the front part of the city. And the, uh, the people that run the city have sent a guy that he knew previously in life we don't know his name. He's just called a guy of lesser status to come out and meet the big man in hopes that he can lead the big man into the city. And the whole chapter is about this discourse that takes place between this big man and the guy of lesser status who used to work for the big man years ago. And the big man comes up with all these reasons why not to enter the city. He says, you know, if, if they're going to allow you in and not allow me in, then, you know, I don't want to go to this place. And, and, and I, I was more right than you, and, and I accomplished more than you. And, and finally, there's this part in chapter 4 where the guy of lesser status looks at the big man, and he says, you do not even see all the ways that you've hurt so many. Your spouse, your children, the people that used to work for you, he can't even see it. And that happens. Maybe we are convicted one day. One of the roles of the Holy Spirit. Convicted of something inside of our life that we know we need to change. But we come up with a number of reasons why not to. Maybe we justify it. Maybe we deny it. Maybe we just park it in our mind that says, one day, I'll change that. And we end up stopping the journey from reaching the end. You know, the whole goal of these sermon series is we want to look at kings, people of influence. And we want to look at parts of their life and we want to learn from their mistakes. Jehu is considered a decent king. Of all the kings in the north, there's only about one or two that are decent. He's one of them. Everybody else is bad. Jehu could have been great, but he didn't see the journey through. Don't let Jehu be your story. The decisions you make today can affect the rest of your life. They can affect your relationships, and it's easy to stop. So what do we do? Would you be uh, so courageous to allow God to show us the areas that need to change? Maybe we've, we've seen them years ago. Maybe over time we've just forgotten about them or, or we've just put them out here for, for someday. Would you allow the role of the Holy Spirit, which is the it, which is to perfect us, which is to help us to mature in our faith, to actually bring to the forefront of our mind again those areas that we've buried for a while. And then to have the courage to walk with him, to see it all the way through. 
That's the lesson today. So may it be for you and for me. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, let's pray. Lord, we, we read about Jehu. We know that so many things he, he did well. And yet, there was something that said that was enough. And he ended up missing out on so much. And I wonder, God, how, how, how alike we are to Jehu. There are things that get revealed to us, and it's so easy to just hope that they'll go away. Or maybe put it under the someday category. And yet what you're after is, you're after purifying us. You're, you're after sanctifying us. Which requires us to walk with you, to see the journey all the way to the end. So grant us clarity. And, and grant us a boldness and a, and a courage to allow you to move inside of us in such a way that together with you, we see it all the way through. You want to create something that looks like your son, Jesus. And so have your way with us, O oh God, we pray. And we ask it in the name of Christ. Amen.
this life within every single beat of my heart. To go forth from this place, we ask, O Lord, your blessing to be upon us, to lift your face up to us, O God, and grant us peace. And we ask this in the name of Christ. Amen. You are dismissed.